When id Software helped popularize the first-person shooter back in the 90s, the entire industry pivoted in response. The market was quickly flooded with so-called Doom clones as publishers scrambled to meet the demand of ravenous gamers. Thanks to burgeoning 3D technology made possible by the PC, players could now explore ancient castles, realistic cities, and even the outer edge of space all through the eyes of their avatar. And it was addictive. In the years that followed, the industry exploded with unbridled creativity as developers tried their hands at building the next great first-person experience. Some succeeded, others failed, but one small developer situated in Redmond, Washington was about to start a quiet revolution. The small group made up of ex-Nintendo staffers left the Japanese giant to pursue their dreams of game creation, only to wind up creating one of the best first-person shooters of the 90s, Power Slave. On consoles, this remarkable game redefined what a first-person shooter could be with its unique focus on traps, puzzle solving, and platforming. It's a fresh take on the genre that sets the stage for games like Metroid Prime, which would follow years later. It's also a technical masterpiece, a game which pushes the Sega Saturn beyond what was thought possible at the time. On this episode of DF Retro then, we're diving into the world of lobotomy software to revisit its seminal first-person adventure, Power Slave. Join me then as we dive headfirst into the world of Power Slave in all its iterations. Lobotomy Software was born in 1993 when Brian McNeely, Paul Langa, Dane Emerson, and Scott Paris left their jobs at Nintendo of America to chase their dreams of game creation. It wasn't long before they had a boxing demo up and running similar to Nintendo's Punch-Out, all while searching for a publisher that would never come. As money started dwindling, however, Lobotomy would take on multimedia projects from Microsoft to help pay the bills. At the same time, they started working on an Egyptian-themed first-person shooter using Ken Silverman's build engine. The game, known as Ruins at the time, was to be published by Apogee Software's 3D Realms and would slot in perfectly with the company's other themed FPS titles including Duke Nukem 3D, Shadow Warrior, and Blood. During development, however, fledgling publisher Playmates Interactive swooped in and scooped up the rights to the game where it would be renamed Power Slave. In addition to finishing the PC release, this deal also included a contract to produce Sega Saturn and PlayStation versions of the game. In Europe and Japan then, BMG Interactive picked up publishing rights where it would be sold as Exhumed and Seireki Senkyu Hyaku Kyuju Kyu Fero no Fukatsu in Japan. Each version of Power Slave offers a unique experience with their own strengths and weaknesses. This isn't a simple case of porting one version to another platform, Lobotomy Software essentially built three different games. Let's begin with the most revered of the three, the Sega Saturn version. Released in 1996, Power Slave for Sega Saturn is somewhat of a miracle. The Saturn was struggling with fast 3D graphics and first-person shooters had yet to become popular on consoles, something that wouldn't really change until a pair of popular N64 titles appeared the following year. While building the game, Lobotomy Software studied titles like Robotica from Acclaim, but it soon became evident that there really wouldn't be that much competition on the system in this space. Power Slave released to reasonable acclaim, but failed to make a dent in the US market, perhaps due to the release date proximity with the original Tomb Raider. But the European version, Exhumed, did manage to do very well in the UK thanks in no small part to Sega Saturn magazine. Dan Jevons and our very own Richard Ledbetter sung the praises of Power Slave, and it did seem to help the game find its footing but it's still a rather niche title that you may not have played, which might leave you wondering, what is it that makes Power Slave such a special game? Well, at its core, Power Slave feels like a game which applies lessons picked up from classic Nintendo games to the Doom formula. It's a first-person shooter, yes, but there's so much more going on beneath the surface. Fans of the game often bring up comparisons with Metroid, and I think an example is necessary to understand what is meant by this. Let's begin here in one of the game's earliest levels. 
After fighting your way through the first few areas, you'll come across several obstacles, including a steep wall that you cannot climb, a large gap that you cannot cross, and several locked doors. But with no other option, you take the first exit you can find and continue on to the next stage. Not long after that though, you'll run across your first artifact, a power-up applied to your character which enhances his abilities much like those power-ups in a Metroid game. And like Metroid, the room where you discover the power-up often serves as a miniature test of your new abilities. You can then travel back to the previous level using a map system that's not unlike something you'd find in a Mario game, and suddenly find new paths are opened. That long jump now reveals a key which opens a door with a power-up inside, while the previously impassable wall reveals a new exit and a body of water. Of course, you still can't swim beneath the water for long, but you can take this new exit to the next area. Several stages later then, you'll uncover the ability to swim underwater for an extended period of time, and now you can return to that same early level, swim through the deep tunnel, and emerge to find a life power-up and an exit to an entirely new area. This is just the basic progression, but you get the idea. Power Slave presents non-linear levels with multiple exits all leading to different stages. Progression in the game is tied to power-ups, which permanently enhance your character, just like Metroid, and it's this piecing together of the game world that winds up being so addictive. Each level feels like a puzzle box that you slowly pull apart to reveal its secrets, and it's just fantastic. As you progress, new challenges start to appear. Platforms become a regular part of the experience, and the slow descent option helps make platforming possible. Yes, Power Slave had first-person platforming that worked, all the way back in 1996. Then of course you have the combat, a central pillar of any first-person action game, and Power Slave nails it. Keep in mind that first-person shooters on consoles hadn't really worked that well at this point, but Lobotomy utilizes a simple technique to work around the issue, auto-aim. Yes, the game tracks your shots above and below the weapon, which removes the need to look up and down during combat something which requires holding a button to initiate. Beyond this, enemies also flash white, letting you know that they're being damaged in a very arcade game sort of way. So why is this important? Well, simple, Power Slave focuses on player movement and weapon choice rather than aiming skills. While not as robust as the lock-on system in Metroid Prime, the central concept is really similar. Eliminate the need to focus on aiming while pushing players in other ways. It's simple and it works. Over the course of the game, you'll unlock eight weapons, and while each has its own ammo count visible as a blue bar here, the ammo itself is universal in the form of blue orbs. This system demands the player to strategically select the right weapon to top off and eliminates the issue of finding specific ammo for certain weapons. It's a brilliantly streamlined concept. Taken as a whole, Power Slave is a cohesive experience that feels unlike any other shooter of its day, but seeing as this is DF Retro, we need to talk about the technology powering the game the in-house Slave Driver engine. You see, when first creating this game, Lobotomy initially intended to port over its work from the PC right onto consoles, but bringing the build engine to these machines proved overly difficult. The strip-based approach of build is not a good fit for either machine, and thus the decision was made to create something new. This is where the extremely talented Ezra Driesback comes in. He architected a fast 3D engine from the ground up for Sega Saturn. At the time, Saturn was struggling with 3D graphics in many games. Low frame rates and obvious limitations were common, but Ezra and the team challenged themselves to utilize the full potential of the Saturn hardware. Power Slave features full 3D environments, enabling complex layouts on par with games like Quake. Large polygonal structures of all shapes and sizes could be displayed using this engine. Rooms above rooms were no longer a problem, and slopes were a piece of cake. Even on the PC, Full 3D graphics engines were still uncommon at the time. Quake had been released and blew everyone away, of course, but a lot of PC shooters still stuck with older technology, including the Doom engine and Bill. The one caveat here is that in Power Slave, objects are rendered as 2D sprites rather than polygonal models like Quake, so in a sense, it feels like a hybrid with aspects resembling games like Doom combined with the full 3D freedom of Quake. Beyond the 3D rendering, the sky layer and weapon sprite are handled by Saturn's VDP2, which displays this as a two-dimensional layer, precisely the reason why invisibility can present true transparency. Then there's the lighting. Power Slave features a form of dynamic light sourcing, allowing enemy attacks and explosions to radiate light across a surface in real time. To pull this off, Ezra started with wall meshes, which are drawn using GORAD shading. 
Even when no dynamic lights are present, there is a static light pass for things like torches or other light sources used to light the stage. For dynamic objects, as the Saturn transforms each vertex, the lighting contribution from the dynamic lights is added in. Power Slave also features a surprisingly rich selection of texture maps used across this world, allowing plenty of variety as you travel through each map. Of course, as I discussed in the Tomb Raider episode, the Saturn works with quads rather than triangles, which in the case of Saturn, are basically distorted sprites with a set of coordinates used to define their position. As a result of this technique, visible texture warping, which differs from the affine texture warping visible on PlayStation, I should note, is present throughout the game. Another limitation lies in its handling of water. When utilizing VDP-1, your options for transparency are limited, and in this case, PowerSlave simply uses the Mesh Transparency option to display the surface of the water. The results, as you can see, are rather unattractive. On a CRT using composite video, the effect could be concealed somewhat, but with an RGB cable, as you see here, the limitations are obvious. Once below the surface, however, there is at least a crude simulation of water caustics, which is a neat touch. It's also worth noting the handling of camera and character movement. Camera roll and sway is implemented to help provide fluid player movement. There's a real sense of momentum and heft when controlling this game. And on top of that, Power Slave supports the Saturn 3D controller, enabling full analog movement and strafing thanks to its analog triggers. At this point, we should talk about performance. Keep in mind that during this era, reaching a stable frame rate with large 3D worlds was not exactly a common feat. All three systems during this era regularly struggled to reach 30 frames per second, let alone 60, and Power Slave is certainly no exception. The frame rate is then quite variable, though still higher than your average full 3D experience on the system. The fluidity of the controls help mitigate the issues, and for the Sega Saturn, the frame rate is quite impressive overall. Most of the issues related to performance center on map complexity, as you might expect. The smaller, more confined areas tend to run a whole lot faster than the more complex rooms with enemies scattered all around. These larger areas tend to push the system really hard. Still, while the performance is poor by today's standards, it was a revelation at the time, especially compared to the awful Doom port that would follow a few months later. Now at this point, I hope that you're starting to get a better idea of what it is that makes Power Slave special. Between its impressive technology, excellent progression system, and interesting level design, it's amazing how well it still holds up today. Then we come to the PlayStation version, which would be released months after the Sega Saturn version, with some significant changes in tow. Power Slave for PlayStation is based on the Sega Saturn game, but it's more of a remix rather than a direct port. A lot of under-the-hood changes were made during development which impact both the look and design of the game. To start with, image quality is improved with smoother overall shading and colors. It's less contrasty than the Saturn game as a result, and it does look quite good. There's also some major strides made in terms of visual features due to the capabilities of the PlayStation hardware. Full transparent water is now available, complete with an undulating water mesh that looks great. Power-ups are also transparent here on PlayStation. Dynamic lighting appears more attractive overall with smoother blending around edges and more vivid colors. Most interestingly, however, the frame rate is dramatically increased. The game still slows down hard, just like Saturn, but it now reaches a full 60 frames per second in many scenes. Unfortunately, this also means that the performance is a lot more variable than before, which isn't necessarily a positive thing in this case, but it is fascinating to see the potential and the game feels great when it runs at 60 frames per second. But here's the thing, while this version does offer several key improvements, it also takes a huge step back from the Saturn version in a multitude of ways. Most noticeably, the levels themselves are dramatically pared back in terms of complexity and scale. Large outdoor areas and temples are reduced in size. This area, for instance, is now much smaller on PlayStation, while its interior is split up into different rooms with arches between each of them. Further down the slope here, we see a similar segmented wall and a missing bridge on the PlayStation. And how about this room? On Saturn, you can see down into the area below and even jump down there, but on PlayStation, it's just reduced to a floor of lava. And how about Zobek Pass? This is a large outdoor area on Saturn with tall cliffs and an open skybox visible at any point. It does run a little slow, mind you, but it feels large and impressive. 
On PlayStation, most of this area is now enclosed, lending it a more claustrophobic feeling. It does have an extended introduction segment at least with this hallway area that is not present on Saturn, but the stage itself lacks a similar sense of scale and feels a lot worse as a result. Even this relatively small map early in the game features noticeable differences. Rooms are often much smaller, like this area where the ceiling and surrounding structures are reduced in complexity on the PlayStation version. This bridge area highlights a common tactic on the PlayStation as well, a big flat wall segmenting the map into a smaller area, not to mention the reduced ceiling height and room scale visible from the ground. The basic issue here is that the PlayStation engine simply didn't allow the developers to display quite as many polygons on screen at any time, so the levels had to be redesigned to accommodate the PlayStation. The levels on PlayStation are still well designed overall and interesting to explore, but the experience feels more claustrophobic and confined. I know I certainly prefer the Saturn original in this sense, but the changes go beyond the visuals. The auto-aim, which is so critical to the Saturn version, is now much less effective. The Saturn version perfectly tracks these flying wasps, for instance, but on PlayStation, they become one of the most annoying enemies in the game, requiring you to stop and adjust your aim just a touch every time they appear. It's basically more difficult and frustrating to hit your targets on PlayStation, which can drag down the pacing of the game. It also feels slightly faster overall, something which mercifully does extend to the swimming, which is sped up significantly. Gravity is also applied to power-up orbs, which immediately fall to the floor after killing an enemy. On Saturn, the same orbs remain floating in space. This isn't really a complaint, mind you, just an observation. But what is a complaint is the lack of analog control. Now, this is perfectly reasonable, as the DualShock controller was only made available months after the game shipped. Unfortunately, this means digital input only. The fantastic analog movement on Sega Saturn simply isn't an option here. And one other small detail, of course, the red spiders from the Saturn version of the game have been changed to blue scorpions. A change made to satisfy Sony's desire for additional or changed content and ports from other platforms. Despite all these changes, however, Power Slave for the PlayStation is still an excellent version of the game and well worth playing. It runs faster, looks nice, and still offers the same great design, but the reduction in level size and inferior controls do put a damper on the experience. But there is one major feature lacking on PlayStation that is difficult to ignore, and that is... Death Tag! Yeah! That's right, the ultimate party game on Sega Saturn. Death Tank is an included minigame that can be either unlocked by mastering Power Slave or inputting a cheat, and it's awesome. Two to seven players can play simultaneously on a single Saturn console and engage in battles similar to titles like Scorched Earth, or a real-time iteration of worms. The basic idea is to arc your shot across the map to hit your opponents while moving ever so slightly to avoid getting hit yourself. The maps are randomized and destructible, which only further enhances the chaos. It's a nice little addition that has gained significant fan following over the years, and it's still fun today. It reappeared later in an enhanced form as Death Tank Zvi in Lobotomy's other Saturn games, and even received an Xbox 360 iteration which is excellent. And you can't play it at all on the PlayStation. Ah well. So earlier in the video, I discussed a build engine version of Power Slave, which was originally known as Ruins. And it just so happens that this alternative version of the game was indeed completed and released. Power Slave for MS-DOS might, in some small way at least, be partially responsible for the game's meager sales in certain territories. You see, the DOS version is an entirely different game altogether from that which appeared on Saturn and PlayStation. It's more of a straightforward Doom-style game. You move from level to level, blasting enemies along the way while hunting for keys and navigating large levels. At the time, this sort of game was extremely common on the platform, making it difficult for Lobotomy's efforts to stand out. The PC was flooded with first-person shooters, and by going up against the likes of the hyper-interactive Duke Nukem 3D and id Software's seminal Quake, Power Slave felt dated. These days, however, it's kind of fun to revisit it, as it offers an FPS experience quite unlike what we have today. The sprawling, key-filled stages are a joy to navigate, and the combat is pretty fun. 
Power Slave is built from an older iteration of the build engine, and lacks some of its more advanced features present in 3D Realms games. Most noticeably, there are no slopes featured in Power Slave, all surfaces are flat, and elevation changes rely on stairs similar to Doom. Unlike Doom, however, it was at least possible to utilize bridges and rooms above other rooms, enabling more nuanced level design. Power Slave even features an attempt to fake things like moving dynamic lights. Check out the fireball in this room. The torch is also necessary when navigating darker areas, which is neat. And another nice touch here is the addition of movable blocks, which, as bizarre as it may seem, wasn't exactly something available in most other shooters. With the extra memory of the PC then, the sprite work is improved over the console versions with slightly higher resolution enemies throughout the game. Of course, the limited 256 color palette ultimately means that this version of Power Slave is filled with obvious color banding and harsh transitions between light levels. The PC version is also rather jerky looking in motion. The camera movement is stiff in comparison and navigating each level never feels especially great. It's missing the fluid platforming and smooth aiming of the Saturn version, and while mods did improve the strafing, the default strafe feature is very slow indeed. It's also completely lacking all the unique progression hooks available in the console version. You're no longer returning to stages with new power-ups nor improving your character's skill set. It's a flat linear progression all the way through, a real step down in my book. On the more positive side though, Power Slave does at least feature a full Redbook audio soundtrack, which was kind of novel at the time. Aside from Quake with its 9 inch nails score, most PC shooters at that point still relied on MIDI tracks. Power Slave, however, utilizes the extra space of a CD to play real digital audio tracks during gameplay, just like the console versions. This even includes specific tracks dedicated to storytelling complete with full voice acting. An evil force known as the Killbot has besieged the sanctity of my palace. And speaking of voice acting, the PC version of the game also features an attitude more in line with what 3D Realms was doing at the time. At random points, for instance, your character will interject with quips such as this. Who's next? Here's the thing though, the PC was the premier place for first person shooters in the mid 90s and releasing a game like this with the same name as the console versions of Power Slave might have caused some unexpected harm. I myself only became aware of Power Slave on Saturn a couple years or so after its release, thinking all the while that it was the same mediocre build engine game that I played on my PC in 96. The general thinking of the time suggested that any PC version of a first person shooter would outshine a console conversion, and it's easy to imagine people skipping out on Power Slave entirely after trying the freely available PC demo of the game. Retaining the same name across three versions of the game also undersells what Lobotomy had achieved. This DOS version of Power Slave is a completely different game altogether, but you wouldn't know it without playing. That the studio was able to produce multiple unique games within such a short span of time is impressive after all and should be celebrated. Still, all told, despite its flaws, Power Slave for MS-DOS is a reasonably fun shooter that simply fails to stand out in a sea of similar games. We are fortunate, however, that Lobotomy's original plans to port the build version of the game to consoles never came to fruition. So. What's a PC gaming Power Slave fan to do then? Emulate the console version? That's always an option, of course, but there's a better solution. Power Slave EX. Thanks to the work of Samuel Kaiser Villarreal, Power Slave lives again on the PC. Well, somewhat. You see, after releasing a beta version of EX a while back, it was removed, likely for legal reasons, but it's not entirely clear. Of course, as a fan, I downloaded it right before it was removed, and well, here it is. Kaiser is well known in the classic FPS scene for his revival of classic games including Doom 64 EX, the first two Turok games for Night Dive Studios, and the upcoming Forsaken EX. Power Slave EX, then, is basically a modern port of the original PlayStation version of the game to Windows. Yes, it is based on the PS1 version, but Saturn maps were seemingly in development as well at one point, but unfortunately will likely never see the light of day. At its core, Power Slave EX runs on Kaiser's custom Kex Engine 3.0, 
While he did reverse engineer certain aspects of the original game, primarily things like enemy health, damage dealt, and the raw assets, most of the code is entirely original. The PlayStation map formats and data have all been changed to a custom format specific to this version as well. And when it all comes together, replaying Power Slave at such a fluid frame rate is a real treat for the senses. High resolution support is available and PC specific controls are included as well, along with a whole slew of visual options. This new presentation completely transforms the experience of playing Power Slave, and it feels amazing. It's just a shame that it was pulled. Perhaps someday in the future the project can be revived, but at the very least Kaiser has seen fit to release the source code, which is available over on his site. The main takeaway here though is, if you have the means, give Power Slave EX a shot, and also be sure to check out his other first person shooter revivals. So, Power Slave came and went. It made a name for Lobotomy software and found a place in the hearts of many. Lobotomy would then go on to develop the remarkable Saturn conversions of Duke Nukem 3D and Quake using its in-house slave driver engine once again. But it was not to last. To those on the outside, Lobotomy seemed untouchable. Power Slave was a top-tier original creation, and those ports of Duke and Quake delivered what many, including John Carmack himself, once thought impossible. Unfortunately, financial reality caught up with the team and Lobotomy Software was closed. Before the end, the studio had other projects in the works, including Power Slave 2. An interview can be found in an old issue of Game Fan Magazine with a few concept images. We do know it was going to be third person at least, but there isn't a whole lot else to say here. It never happened. If you're interested in further exploring the history of the studio itself, however, do check out the description box below for a few juicy links. And with that, we've come to the end of another episode. Hopefully you've enjoyed this last look at the genius of Lobotomy Software. Not only was this studio responsible for one of the best shooters of the generation, it also helped kick off DF Retro as a series, with its impressive port as Quake for the Sega Saturn, which served as inspiration to begin covering classic games. That's all for now though. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and follow me over on Twitter. And until next time, Stay retro.